Right around six weeks ago, I had a viewer post a comment down in one of my videos asking if I was planning on reviewing the Hunan Dual X79 motherboard. And as it turns out, it takes about six weeks for one to get here. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and this is kind of an oddity. Now, if you remember back to July of 2017, that's exactly when this channel started, and I started on essentially this same exact kind of thing, which was a Chinese-made dual X79 motherboard. Uh, as we all know, at this point, that motherboard had nothing to do with X79 outside of the socket itself. This one promises to be just a little bit different. So we're gonna run through an unboxing here real quick. Uh, now, the reason I'm taking this all out of the box and not explaining much is I realized, I've, I've already done a, a brief unboxing myself, uh, that the reason they shipped it in a cardboard box, plain cardboard box, is all they did was flip around the retail box to ship it through customs. So I'm gonna flip it back around so we can get a proper unboxing experience. There we go. We have a dual X79, uh, which by the way, there's no such thing as dual X79. We'll get into that. Uh, Hunan's dual X79 uh, motherboard. The first Chinese board that I reviewed in a retail box. All right, and unfortunately, all of the information in here is Chinese for the most part. Uh, so let's just go and get this thing open again, and let's go over the specs. So there is the board itself. Uh, obviously the dual 2011 sockets take up the majority of the space on this board. One thing I noticed right on the outset though, uh, besides the uh, heat sinks that are included on the VRM, Hunan, thank you very much, uh, is this series of CPUs is quad channel memory and there's only two DIMMs per CPU on here. So at best, we're gonna be running in dual channel mode on these CPUs. Whether or not that hurts performance, I'm not sure yet. Let's just run down the specs of this thing. Obviously, it is a dual 2011 socket. Now, this will take any Xeon CPU from the E5 2600 V1 or V2 series. It will not, however, accept processors from the E5 1600 V1 or V2 or your uh, i7-based SKUs. Those are single processor SKUs only. Whether or not they work on this board, I'm not sure. I think I have a 1620 V2 around here somewhere. I might be able to test if this will work with a single CPU, but Obviously, I wouldn't recommend running this with only a single CPU. It's got a 24-pin ATX power connector and dual 8-pin EPS power connectors, one for each CPU. There are a couple of uh, PWM headers on the top for the CPU fans, and then there's also two 3-pin fan headers on the bottom. A little bit limited in a board with this much power going through it, in my opinion, although there's nothing stopping you from adding a fan controller. Again, those aforementioned two DIMMs per socket running in dual channel mode, I'm assuming we will verify that. There are two 1X PCIe slots on here and two 16X PCI slots in here. And one thing I appreciate more than anything else on this board is the fact that the PCIe slots are properly spaced out. I can fit two dual slot graphics cards in here in the X16 slots and still plug in the 1X slots with other cards. Uh, a lot of times the 1X slots are directly underneath the PCIe X16 slots. And if you put a dual slot graphics card in there, you can't fit another card in there. So very, very well thought out. I, I do really like this layout. On the side of the board, we've got six SATA ports in total. Looks like uh, two SATA 3.0 ports and four SATA 2.0 ports, although I will be verifying that again once we get into the BIOS of this. Uh, we've got two USB 2.0 front panel headers and a USB 3.0 front panel header. Uh, standard front I.O. for your lights and buttons and whatnot. Uh, we've got a front serial port connector, which is kind of interesting, and a front audio connector as well. Around the back, we've got our audio connections. We've got gigabit ethernet, six USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.0 ports, and a PS2 keyboard and mouse if you fancy a need. Now, one thing I do want to do on this is I'm going to remove the chipset heatsink on here because I want to see what this chip is. There we go, so a nice just little aluminum heatsink there. And we do have a thermal pad on there. And that is a... There we go. That is a B082C602 uh, SLJKG. That is, from what looks like it, that is a genuine Intel C602 chipset. That would be quite interesting because C602 is actually the server and workstation version of the X79 chipset that enables dual CPUs. Uh, as I said, there's no such thing as a dual X79 chipset. Uh, or even dual X79 
socket boards. They are C602 boards. And if that's a genuine C602 chipset, which I have no reason to believe it's not, this could be about as close to a genuine X79 board as you can get, or rather a genuine C602 board as you can get, especially for the 190 bucks that it is. That's insane. Now I'm really excited. <laughs> I think that's about really all the features that I can go over on this board without putting it together. So let's get this thing put together. So on the back counter behind me, you might have noticed a collection of parts. I've been uh, putting those together for about the last six weeks since I ordered this board in preparation for the build. Let's go ahead and uh, walk through what the build is and then get this thing running. Starting with yet another eBay purchase. These are my CPUs. And if you guess that I went with dual 2670s, you're gonna be wrong. I actually went with dual 2690s. These are 2.9 gigahertz base clock, 3.8 gigahertz turbo, eight core CPUs. And uh, these should do fairly well. They're not the best CPUs ever for this platform, but they're the best that I can get for about $200. I paid uh, $95 each for these. Next up is our memory. And this right here is 64 gigabytes of DDR3 registered ECC memory. I really hope that this board both supports registered memory as well as 16 gigabyte DIMMs because the last versions of these boards did not. However, that was not running with a genuine C602 chipset. So that might be the difference between us getting eight gig DIMMs versus 16 gig DIMMs running. I do have a backup plan if these don't work though. Deepcool asked me what projects I had on the horizon. And once they found out about this one, they were kind enough to send me over a pair of Gamax GT Black Edition heat sinks. Now this is the same exact heat sink that I used on my streaming PC rebuild. And you can go and click right up there if you want to see that. They also sent me over an EATX motherboard compatible uh, Matrix 55 case with RGB. So big shout out to Deepcool for uh, doing a, a little bit of a sponsorship on this build. Powering this monstrosity is gonna be my EVGA 850GQ 80 plus gold power supply. Uh, this has been around the block a little bit. It first powered my X99 build, and in fact, it ran Threadripper for the first couple of months of its life here, uh, but great power supply. Uh, and just to make sure we don't have any GPU bottlenecks, I'm gonna be running an RS GTX 1080 Ti. Again, huge shout out to Superfan Claw who sent this over to me. Uh, Claw over on the Patreon, you freaking rock, even if your 7820X was dead. So without further ado, let's, uh, oh, storage. I think I'm just gonna go shopping on my shelf. You'll see. Uh, without any further ado, let's get this thing put together. As you can see, the build is complete and looking mighty fine if I do say so myself. Uh, so the, for the rest of this video, we're not gonna talk about overall system performance as far as like gaming performance. If you wanna see those metrics, that's coming in my next video. So stay tuned for that later this week. Uh, what I wanna go over today is the motherboard itself, the assembly, the configuration, how I'm running my system, uh, what pitfalls did I come across, which there are a couple worth mentioning in here. Um, I've also got a couple notes on the case that I wanna go over and any other things that, uh, that crossed my mind during this build. So first off, yes. It does turn on and it does work. And we've got all 16 cores, all 32 threads, and all 64 gigs of memory. Jumping into the BIOS here, you can see all 64 gigs of memory are uh, available under total memory there. And if we move over to CPU configuration, we can see that socket zero is populated with an E5 2690 at 2.9 gigahertz and the same on socket one. So we do have all of our cores, all of our RAM. That was a huge load off my mind. 
A couple other quick notes before we move on on the processors. Uh, as we can see, again, hyper-threading is enabled, and we also have Intel VTX technology, which is uh, virtualization hardware pass-through, which is a really nice feature to see enabled on this board. I was a little disappointed to see that, despite this being a genuine Intel C602 chipset, unlike the P75 knockoffs that I've reviewed in the past, uh, they're using the same Aptio and AMI BIOS as the previous boards, which means we still have no overclocking support at all. I mean, obviously there's no unlocked multiplier on the CPUs, but we also don't even get, uh, I can't overclock the base clock. I can't get any more performance out of these chips than what ships. So keep that in mind. This is a powerful system, but if you're looking at overclocking, this is not the answer. The interesting thing about this is the thing that I was most worried about in the system was my memory choice. Like I said, I wanted as much memory as I could possibly squeeze into here. Uh, so I've got 64 gigs of RAM, uh, registered ECC. Uh, I didn't know that this was going to be capable of using that particular memory. Like I said, I've had issues with the previous knockoff X79 boards accepting larger than eight gigabyte DIMMs. Uh, so going with 16 gigs was a little bit of a risk, but I think it paid off. And strangely enough, it was the easiest thing to configure as these are the out of the box settings for this. So if we go into the Northbridge configuration, you can see the total memory is uh, 64 gigs there. It's actually running at 1600 megahertz uh, out of the box. I didn't have to touch anything. So that is pretty awesome. A previous issue that I've had on these X79 boards was the fan control. Uh, the three pin fan headers don't ramp up or down with, uh, with CPU load. In fact, they're not controllable at all. It's just like plugging in a Molex header to a 12 volt fan. Fan, they just run at 100%. And unfortunately, that bug still exists. So if I go under smart fan function here, uh, the PWM1 and PWM2 for the two CPU fan headers, those are controllable and you can see they're actually pretty configurable as far as what temperature and what speed that I want them to run at. Unfortunately, those three pin fan headers on the bottom of the board still are not controllable. When I first powered on the system, these three front fans here were running at 100% and the system was ungodly loud. Uh, I did end up putting in an eight channel PWM splitter and I'm running that off of the CPU two fan header, which is the hotter of the two running CPUs. So my fans will ramp up and down with the hottest CPU core that I have. One thing I will note as well on the temperatures uh, on this case was I was hoping just to run the three front fans and then the two CPU fans. Unfortunately, this, uh, this Gamax GT doesn't have enough pressure to get the air out of the case. I was getting this little hot air bubble right here, which was heating up my VRM quite significantly and not actually allowing the case to vent. And in fact, uh, my rear CPU was idling at like 62C or something like that. Uh, I ended up putting in an EK Vardar rear fan to really get that hot air out of the case. And trust me, there's a lot of hot air moving out of this case now. I can feel it this far away, even with the system at idle. Uh, so these are not cold running CPUs. Other bugs, let's see, uh, UEFI doesn't seem to be working 100% on this board. Uh, it certainly doesn't support UEFI network boot, although legacy network boot does work just fine. Uh, I did run into an issue where I had a UEFI USB installer. That key wasn't even recognized in BIOS as a boot option, uh, either on the USB 3.0 or 2.0 ports. So I don't know if I was doing something wrong, Probably not, uh, but EFI doesn't seem to be functioning for me. I had to uh, install Windows 10 in legacy mode. There also seems to be a weird bug when I reboot the system. Let me see if it will happen here. Uh, just by hitting Control Alt Delete, um, where the board will reboot and then freeze. Uh, no, it looks like we're gonna boot here. It will stick on uh, B4 as a postcode and I, there's no record of what the postcodes on this are, so uh, undocumented, but uh, I have had that issue happen a number of times, especially when I was installing Windows and running a couple updates, that uh, if I just initiated a soft reboot from the system, it would hang on B4 and, and lock up entirely. Here we are inside of Windows, and as you can see, I've got all 16 cores and 32 threads fully visible here, and that is just a beautiful thing to see. I've also got all 64 gigs of my DDR3 ECC memory. Uh, if we jump over here to hardware info, we can see that our max turbo is reaching the 3.8 gigahertz that it should, which is nice to see. So Intel speed step and turbo are both functioning. Uh, I will note, however, that our max all core turbo seems to be about 3.3 gigahertz under CPU intensive load. So running Cinebench or something like that. Uh, and I believe that's just a limitation of the CPU. At idle, the CPUs run a little bit toasty. Again, I can feel some hot air moving out of here. Uh, CPU zero is idling at about 37C and CPU one is idling at about 42, 43C. 
those are actually pretty normal temperatures for these CPUs. Uh, Xeons don't step down quite as much as their consumer counterparts do. So uh, this only drops down to about 1200 megahertz, whereas a normal chip would drop down to about 800. So at idle, these do generate a little bit more heat and draw a little bit more power than some consumer CPUs do but these are perfectly normal temperatures. And max that I saw was about 55C on, on either of these two chips. So these coolers are more than up to the task of handling these Xeons. Moving over to CPU Z to get a little bit closer look at the motherboard and the memory. And here's where things get a little bit interesting. Now you'll remember, I pulled the Southbridge heatsink off of this motherboard and verified it is an Intel Genuine C602 chipset, which is the server chipset for Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge E CPUs. But moving over to the, the motherboard tab here, we do show the manufacturer showing up as Hunan, but the chipset is showing up as an X79 and Sandy Bridge E chipset. I'm, I'm curious as to why they, they're masking the fact that it's an Intel C602. I would actually have more faith in this board if it showed up as an Intel C602 and not some, again, hacked together X79 system. Uh, They're branding it as a dual X79, which there's no such thing as. Uh, and even in their their configuration and display, they're showing it as X79. It's just a curious bit of marketing. Memory, on the other hand, I am very impressed with on this board. Uh, so we are running in dual channel, which again is a little bit of a load off my mind. And we are running at 1600 megahertz with uh, cast latency of 11, 11, 11, 28, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, that is what this memory is rated for, but I'm really surprised that out of the box, this just worked on this board with no configuration needed by me. And of course, you know, we have to do a live Cinebench run before we do much else, just to see all 32 threads cranking away at this thing. Ah, good coffee. And there we go, a 2207, a little bit low from the 2230 that I hit at its peak. Uh, but again, this is consistently running within about 30 points. Uh, the lowest I've seen, I, I don't think I've seen anything in the 2100s. Everything has been 2205 to, to that 2230 range. So very, very consistent runs in Cinebench multi-thread. Another thing that I wanted to verify that was working with this board was ECC memory support. Now the two previous X79 boards that I've used, one of them supported ECC mode, the other worked with ECC memory but did not actually enable ECC support. So I wanted to verify that it was working on this. So one thing that you can do is just type this command right here into PowerShell to see the memory mode that you were working in. So if we do that right now, we can see we are working in mode six, which is multi-bit ECC mode. So yes, ECC memory is supported by this board. So who is this board for? Well, in just a second, I'm gonna show you my single threaded Cinebench score to kind of summarize what I'm talking about, although I'm talking in very broad strokes here. I think this board is for someone who wants the most amount of cores and the most amount of RAM that they can possibly throw out a system for the least amount of money. Uh, the CPUs, the motherboard, and the memory on this cost me $585 which for a 16 core 32 thread system with 64 gigs of RAM, that is insanely cheap. Uh, today, there's a Black Friday special going on on the 1950X Threadripper chip for $450 to get you the same 16 core 32 thread. And that's just the processor. That's not including memory or motherboard or anything like that. Uh, so for a base system build, this is insanely cheap for what it is. Performance wise though, again, if you need something that has an insane amount of multi-threading performance. This is not a terrible value, but we'll, let's get into the comparisons here. So I know I'm showing you Cinebench, which is again, kind of a broad stroke comparison, but it does a really good job of really categorizing CPUs as far as where they fall in ranks compared to other CPUs. So we can see uh, the uh, dual 2690 system is actually the fastest system that I've personally benchmarked as far as multi-threaded CPU uh, work goes. So we can see a 2230 with my dual 2690s. My Threadripper system, 1900X, is running at 1827 with only eight cores and 16 threads. And we can go down our list here. We've got a 1700X clocking in. Uh, we've got our 8700K at 1441. Uh, we've got our Ryzen 2600 at 1220. So we can see multi-threaded workloads, this is going to dominate most other chips that are out there. 
Unfortunately, single-threaded performance tells a little bit different story as far as the value goes. Now, obviously, we've got our 8700K sitting here at the top at 204. Uh, we've got a bunch of processors sitting in the 170 to 175 range with our 5820K and i5-8400, and our uh, even our Ryzen 2600 taking an appearance here at 171. Uh, Threadripper here at 167, that's the 1900X. Unfortunately, we have to scroll all the way down into the 120s to find where our dual 2690 CPU is landing us. Uh, and as you can see at 125, it's sitting between an i5-3470 and the 2643 and 2667 Xeon CPUs that I've previously tested on these X79 boards. So gaming performance, this is not going to be a breadwinner for you. It, it's, it has decent performance, but we're starting to get into talks of is Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge still worth it? And keep in mind, this is just a Sandy Bridge chip. That This is the same technology that's in the i7-2600 or the i5-2500. And those CPUs are starting to get a little bit long in the tooth when it comes to single threaded performance when they're not overclocked. So where does this system sit as far as value goes? Well, again, $585 gets you 16 cores, 32 threads, and 64 gigabytes of registered ECC memory. That is absolutely insane from a numbers perspective. But what does it mean as far as what you're doing on it? If you're looking at this as a gaming machine, at 1080p, you're going to struggle. Uh, this 1080 Ti is way overpowered for the system. And in fact, I've ran some preliminary gaming benchmarks and I am CPU limited severely when it comes to 1080p high refresh gaming on this. At 1440 and 4K, it was a little bit less so, but we'll get into those numbers in the next video. If we take the focus away from gaming for a second and we take a look at this as like a workstation machine for video rendering or for CAD work or for, for things like that, I think this machine would do very, very well. And the value really is there for something like that, especially if you're looking for like a home server or a virtualization head unit for, for your home lab. Uh, this is a great value for what you're getting out of this system. But again, you really need to temper your expectations as far as that single threaded CPU performance goes. Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge is really starting to show its age. Age, as much as Intel hasn't been able to progress the CPU market forward on their own right, uh, these CPUs are still from 2011. They are not the fastest things out there. I've voiced my opinions on these X79 knockoff boards before. If I were reviewing a retail motherboard from Intel or Asus or ASRock or someone like that, I would not be giving this board a good review. Uh, it, locks up sometimes on a soft reboot. There's zero overclocking options. There's very little memory configuration options. It struggles with EFI booting. It doesn't have EFI Pixie support. It doesn't have a lot of other things. It, I can't even control the fans on this thing. But in terms of value, you have to kind of do a little bit of a give and take here. If this board was $450, it would be getting a bad review. I've seen this board on AliExpress for 180 bucks. So you have to, again, temper your expectations with what you expect to get versus what it's actually delivering to you. Would I recommend the Hunan Dual X79 motherboard? Question of the hour. I think I would recommend it as long as your needs meet what this board can actually deliver. Yes, you get insane performance for your money when it comes to multi-threaded and, and RAM capacity. You do not get great value for money if you're talking about gaming performance or single-threaded tasks. The board does work, it does boot up, but you have to expect some glitches to come with it. One last thing to keep in mind before we close here is outside of the motherboard glitches and weird configurations and no BIOS options is simply the raw amount of power that these CPUs require. Each CPU draws 125 watts on its own. So under full tilt, just CPU workstation tasks, this system's drawing in excess of 300 watts. So the Hunan Dual X79 Chinese motherboard. Yes, it turns on. Yes, you get ECC and a crazy amount of multi-threaded performance and memory capacity, but you have to be aware of what the trade-offs are. And I'm really curious to know, does anyone out there plan on using one of these boards for your next build? Let me know down in the comments. Genuinely curious to hear what you guys think of this one. And that's gonna do it for me in this one. Make sure to stay tuned for part two for gaming benchmarks on this. I think I'm gonna stick with 1440p for benchmarks, but let me know if you guys wanna see a couple 1080p benchmarks as well. I just don't think they're gonna be favorable enough to even warrant doing. Anyway, if you're watching this on Wednesday or Thursday, have a very happy Thanksgiving. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.